Hello everyone, Mr. Minnick is my name, math is my game. Here I am with my statistics class and today we're talking about sampling methods. We started to talk about sampling methods before, so technically um, nobody knows what this is anymore because they don't, I can't believe they don't go over this in schools. You know what kind of writing that is? Curvis. When I was in third grade there was a boy who said, Mrs. Pavlis, do we have to write in Curvis? My S kind of looks like a backwards ampersand, but, but it's, it's for real, sampling methods. Uh, so technically today we're talking about other sampling methods. So if, if you're uh, numbering your notes, you're labeling your notes, this is chapter one still, uh, and, and we're in the third section. So this is sampling methods, and it's really other sampling methods, because on yesterday, that's so weird to say on yesterday, but yesterday we talked about simple random samples, yes? Good. So today we're going to talk about some other sampling methods, starting with one that's not in the book, one that's real easy, one that's easy, simple, uh, involves selecting, I, I always get ahead of myself when I write, it involves selecting things and I'm going to put an asterisk by the word things. Things could be blades of grass. Things could be restaurants in the 330. Things could be people. People are things. I know it's kind of weird to, to think of people as things. but um, So no matter what, whenever you take a sample of some stuff, selecting those things that are within, um, within reach or... Um, convenient or convenient to access or convenient to access. Now, similar to how we had a, an essay quiz um, last week on some stuff, there's going to be an essay quiz over all these sampling techniques. And I'm going to ask you not only to put them in your own words, but also to give a visual example of each. Okay, so, so we'll try to do that with each one of these. So what technique do you reckon this would be called? What do you think is a good name for it? It's called convenience. Yeah, some textbooks have this. Your textbook doesn't, but this is called convenience. It's called convenience sampling, okay? So you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute. I did the math Excel homework, and there was a question, and it talked about convenience sampling. So where'd that come from? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but when I make the math Excel homeworks, I can actually get homeworks from other test banks and from other textbooks. Okay, so um, in statistics, this is a recognized sampling method. It's easy. It's simple. It involves selecting things that are within reach or convenient to access. It's called convenience sampling. So I do like to list some benefits and or some pros and cons to each method. So let's think about some pros. What's good about this? Anybody got any ideas? What's good about this? It's convenient. Yeah. It's convenient. I was thinking of Guns N' Roses. They had a song that would fit perfect. It's so easy. Nothing seems to please me. That's a, it's, a, it's a really low song. Axl Rose normally is like screaming and stuff. It's a real cool song, but it's so easy. It's so easy. There were lots of songs back in the, back in the day written about, about that. Um, Chicago had a good one. Anybody know which one? Because I'm easy. Ah, I'm easy like Sunday morning. Do you know that one? It's a great song. What else is good about convenient sampling? It's quite the opposite of that woman from Cleveland. I don't know where she was from. Remember the woman that said, Oh, Lord Jesus, it's a far. What did she say after that? I think nobody got time for that. So the quite the opposite of that is, it's pretty quick, isn't it? Quick, saves time. Energy, maybe even resources as well, right? 
it's going to save time, energy, and resources. Because let's face it, if we're talking about restaurants in the 330 and we just go to all the restaurants right here in Garrettsville, well, we're not driving everywhere. We're not driving to Akron or to Streetsboro or to Warren or to Niles or to Howland or to Vienna, wherever the heck that's at. Anybody know where Vienna is? So those are a few pros. Can anyone think of anything else good about this convenience method? That's probably a, a good enough list, I would think. So let's look at some cons then, some, some things about this. If you're not sure what a con would be, think about what we said simple random sampling is all about and why we even have simple random sampling. So what do we got? There, there it is. Nice. Something about bias. Simple random sampling is to avoid bias. So the problem with this is it's likely it's likely to produce to produce or introduce or introduce bias. Okay. You might say, well, how is that going to happen, Mr. Minnick? I don't get it. Well, what would happen if, out of convenience, rather than actually going to the restaurants, we just stopped at restaurants where people were set up on the side of the road, where they don't have a restaurant license, where they're not paying overhead of electric and having to get uh, health inspection uh, things by the state. Anybody ever see them? There's the one guy that drives around with the cart, the hot dog cart, and he sets up at the top of the hill at Rattlesnake Hill. Anybody ever see him? Okay, I don't know if that guy's got a food license or not, but if I had to guess, I'd say probably not. Maybe he does. I don't know. I could be wrong. But um, anyway, he doesn't have all that overhead. You know, when you're in business, you got overhead, like bills to pay and insurance to have and stuff like that. So let's think about what you're going to see at the side of the road. Anybody see anybody else set up on the side of the road where they pull a trailer behind them? What do they usually cook? Hot dogs, ribs, ribs. Ribs and ribs, right? You ever go through Warren? There's like 17 little rib vendors all over the place. Not that there's anything wrong with ribs, okay? But the point is, what if we chose to only look at restaurants that were set up on the side of the road out of convenience in our travels? That would introduce bias, wouldn't it? Because of the 17 that we found, 16 of them sold ribs. Okay. Okay. What else is, is wrong with this this convenient sampling? Let's think in the classroom sit situation. What would happen if the teacher asked the first row? What's wrong with that? It's not really random. Which why, how would how would asking people just the first row introduce bias? Yeah. Yeah, the first row is probably not representative of the entire class because because the people sitting in the first row. Some people might think, well, they're um, they're the teacher's pet. They're they they can't see. They're blind as a bat. I don't know. Who knows? Okay, I'm I'm just throwing stuff out there. Okay, but it's not representative of the entire class. Good. So a, a real nice thing here then is it's not likely to be representative. To be representative. That's a real big word in in all this sampling. It's not likely to be representative. Okay. If we look in this particular class, we've got um, male students sitting in the first row, and, and in this class, most of the class is females. So it's definitely not representative of the whole class. Good. Um, 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 I think that's probably good for cons. Does anybody have any other con, anything that's bad about taking a, a convenient sample? Just from an ethical point of view, there's a four-letter word that comes to mind. It's lazy, yeah. I mean, uh, anytime you do some work, you really should should put some effort into it. And, and to be honest, this technique, it's it's lazy. And, and sometimes lazy gets you by, but lazy's not the best, okay? Everybody doing all right so far today? Good. So for my drawing, then, I, I did say I'd like to have a visual of this. So for, here's my drawing. I'll make a box. I love boxes. 
There's a red one and a green one and a blue one and a yellow one. And they all... I just feel like singing today. I don't know why. So here's this box. Here's all these lines in this box. Do-do-do-do. 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 It almost looks like a flag. So here's this box. And actually with this box, I'm going to use this one again and again and again. So, so I want to group all this stuff together. And I actually want to go ahead and put it, put it in here. Okay, cool. Do I have a volunteer to come on down and, and, and put some smiley faces or, or some kind of, well, I, let, me, let me see. Uh, maybe some big X's. I think I have a, a big X here. There we go. Or, or a big check mark, yeah. We'll use the G Men check mark. There we go. Is that, is that too big, you think? So we need to make that G Men check mark a little smaller. Better? All right, so we're infinitely cloning that. I have a volunteer to come on down and put it. Yeah, we got one right here. So we're going to put some check marks in a box. In some of the boxes, it would represent a convenience sample. And, and there's the rogue line. Don't feel bad. It's been happening to me all week long. This new smart board software is, is not as smart as it, it claims to be. Oh, let's, let's click that. Maybe that. Oh, there we go. Let's try that. See what happens. So here we go. A convenience sample. Let me lock this box into place, too. That might help, too. So locking. Uh, just about six, five or six or seven, something like that. There goes the rogue line again. It's so frustrating. So here we go. Bob Saget is a good comedian who was in Full House, who was Danny Tanner, the dad. What the heck? Come on now, smart board. You're 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 being you're being weird. There we go. We got one, really? We got one out of all that. Come on now. Let's let's see if the let's see if the keyboard mouse works. Yeah, you might want to use the keyboard mouse. You have to use the keyboard mouse. Sorry about that. So if you're watching this back, all the yelling's about the smart board. It's, it's not being smart. It's not being cooperative. So we're doing a visual example of what a convenience sample would look like. And so far, it doesn't look to be convenient. A, a visual representation of a, of a convenience sample. That's looking more like a, a lazy way of, of selecting it. Yeah, everybody. That's good. Everybody in the first row. Nice. Good. Everybody all right with that? Questions, comments, concerns, short debates, long debates about that. I really like to see the drawings on the essay tests on these. Essay tests and they're drawing? Yeah. Some people like to put up their hand and say, oh, me. Speaking of which, that reminds me of the next sample type that's not in your book. Pick me. Pick me. Uh, anybody ever go to a website and have that little pop-up and say, would you like to take a survey? Anybody ever? Yeah. Would you like to take a survey? Uh, what about the catalogs? Anybody subscribe to a catalog or a magazine or anything like that? And you get a magazine and those magazine surveys, magazine survey that you send in, right? Um, here, and this really only applies to, to humans. This one's real hard to apply to inanimate objects, yeah. 
It's called voluntary response. Yeah, and here's here's the description. Respondents respondents choose to be a part to be a part of the sample. Respondents choose to be a part of the sample. And it is called voluntary response. A voluntary response. Or another way to put it, if you don't like voluntary response, uh, some textbooks call it a self-selected a self-selected sample. And again, just to kind of go back over the fact that it's hard for any inanimate objects to do this, think about grass, blades of grass. Blades of grass. If we want to go find blades of grass and they're volunteering, how could we tell they're volunteering? Because they're sticking up a little bit higher than the others? Oh, that, that doesn't really cut it. What about restaurants? Is a restaurant going to have a, a billboard that says, please pick me for your survey? Probably not. So, so usually here we're talking about human objects being in the in this um, sample and being in the population. Everybody all right with that? Well, for this next one, I'm going to need. Uh, let's see. Here's my where's my picture at? Here it is. Did it go in here? Yeah, there it is. So there's my picture. Uh, there's Patrick. There's Patrick. Well, right, we'll just use a whole bunch of Patricks. I like Patrick. Infinite clone. Got a volunteer to to drag some Patricks around and 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 finish the visual representation of this. Let me lock this in place. Got a volunteer here. How ironic is that? No volunteers for the voluntary response. So I'll do this one. So here's a Patrick. There's a Patrick. There's a Patrick. There's a Patrick. There's a Patrick. And what are they all going to be doing or saying? Oh, pick me. Pick me. A little comment bubble, right? I actually have a comment bubble thing on the smart board, but ain't nobody got time for that. So, pick me, pick me, pick me. We're not saying pick me, we're saying pick me, choose me. I'm the one. Maybe I'm the one. Maybe I'm the one. Maybe I'm the one who is, you know that one? That song? Nobody knows that song? You all don't listen to that kind of music? Okay. So, so far we've seen two of these techniques. I said we had a lot to go over in class today, so these two weren't even in the book yet. Before we move on, we've got to talk about some pros and cons to this. A good thing about it, and a bad thing about it. Or some good things and some bad things. Anybody got either one? What do we think? Yeah, people with strong feelings are likely to respond. And we all know what that's going to lead to. The B word. Do you think that we should bring back pizza bobs to the lunch menu? The people that are going to respond in that survey are probably going to be the people that like pizza bobs. The people that don't like pizza bobs could care less. People that hate pizza bobs might say, yeah, I don't want them. People that love uh, the, the, the pizza bobs might say, I love them, let's bring them back. But, so let's think about that. Is there going to be bias? There's actually going to be bias on both ends, but, but as um, we said, chances are if somebody feels very strongly for something, they're more likely to respond. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's going to lead to some bias. What's uh, what's a good thing about this? Is there a good thing about it? Well, 
what if I were to give you all a survey about acoustic guitar strings? Different gauges, brands, and types of acoustic guitar strings. Most of you probably wouldn't know much about them and be able to provide any educated insight to them, right? But if you did know a lot about them, then you would have an educated insight, right? So one thing that's good about this is since those people have a, a, a strong feeling about it, um, a lot of times here, respondents, respondents are well versed on the topic. Somebody mentioned Seventeen Magazine. What do you think about these clothes? You're the fashion police, and you love fashion, and you're all about clothes, and, and you know what's in and what's out and what's hot and what's not. And if you do, then you're going to respond. You're going to say, heck yeah, that looks dumb. You shouldn't wear that. That looks great. You should wear that. Isn't that what Joan Rivers did? She was like the fashion police for the last 81 years. Okay. So... Because people have a strong feeling, they might be well-versed and well-educated, and I can think of that being a, 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 an advantage to this volunteer response. That makes sense? Okay. If anybody thinks anything else, let me know. Well, up next, we got this one. Um, every nth thing is chosen Every nth thing is chosen. What the heck is n? Well, it's a natural number. It's one, it's two, it's three, it's four, it's five. It's every third, every fourth, every fifth. Every, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Um, what's this called? Systematic, good. It's called systematic. Can anyone think of an example of this in... Uh, that, that shows up in schools all the time? Used to show up in phys ed, now they probably don't so much. But back in my day we had to do this and it was rather embarrassing if you were born prematurely and had a caved in chest on the left side like I did. I'm getting old. They don't do that in gym class anymore? Shirts and skins? They don't do that? Okay. Well, back in the day, we used to do shirts and skins in gym class. Shirts and skins, they don't do that anymore. Wow, I'm getting old. Girls didn't do it. They put on like a red jersey or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So back in the day, we had shirts and skins. Um, how else could you do this? Count off by, yeah, count off by threes, count off by threes. So here's the thing about this, um, and we'll, we'll talk about the pros. Nope, oh, I've been putting the pros in green and the, the pros and the cons. If we're talking about checking a car off the assembly line in a factory, every fifth car, every fifth car in the assembly line, we're going to get every fifth car, no, no doubt about it, right? And chances are that's going to be representative of the people. Now, I don't know if this happens in your gym class or not. So here's these people, here's these people, here's these people, here's these people. Here's these people. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And you don't like some of the people here. So so here's a one and here's a two, and here's a one and here's a two, and here's a one and here's a two. Well, these people down here, they're looking in line and they're aren't they trying to switch positions in line? Because to, to to see. So here's the problem with this. I see it as a problem. With humans involved, humans can like jump or switch places in line, and that could be a potential problem, okay? So with humans, the human element, the human element leads 
It's a line jumping. It never failed in my gym class. We always had this one football team that was stacked with like all the best athletes in the in the school. Was always on that one football team and they always killed everybody else in gym class. Never failed. Because people would jump lines like that. Well, what's a good thing about this? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's not likely to introduce bias. Not likely to introduce, to indro, introduce, I can write. It's not likely to in, introduce, introduce bias. If followed as outlined. Now your book does go into detail. There's, there's a specific way to do this, and I don't think we're going to talk about that today because we're not going to have time. If you want to read up on it, it is in the book in 1.3. Check out the book. Um, there actually is a real detailed way to do this. It's three steps. You take the population size. You divide it by the sample size. You round that down to a number M. And then you pick a number between 1 and M, and that's the number K, and you take K plus M and K plus 2M and K plus 3M and K plus 4M. Yeah, it, it gets really complicated, but we're not going to go into all that. So in here, for instance, this is a class of size 25. So we would divide 25 by however big of a sample size we want. Say we want a size uh, sample of size f uh, 4. 25 divided by 4 is 6 and a quarter. We'd round that down to 6. So 6 would be our one number, and we'd randomly pick a number between 1 and 6. Let's say it was 2. So we'd take 2, and then we would add um, 6 to that. So we'd pick the second person, and then we'd pick the eighth person, and then we'd pick the whatever's after 8, 6 more after 8, 14th, and so on. Okay. So it, it kind of gets complicated, but it's really not that bad. Any questions so far? All right. So we do need a visual example of this. So let's get that uh, let's get that box. This time we'll use SpongeBob. SpongeBob SquarePants. So we'll lock that in place. We'll make SpongeBob small enough, and we'll use an infinite cloner. Yep, I got a volunteer to try this one. Every other, every third, every fourth, every fifth. Nobody wants to mess with the rogue lines, so here we go. Um, so let's go every third. So there's the first, there's the second, there's the third. Uh, fourth, fifth, sixth. Uh, so that's six, so that's seven, that's eight, that's nine. So we'll end up back here. Uh, Whoa. T 10, 11, 12. Uh, 13, 14, 15. That's kind of weird the way that worked, isn't it? So 15, 16, 17. Am I counting right? 18? Something seems wrong, but no, I guess that's right. 19, 20, 21. 22, 23, 24. 25, 26, 27. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. There we go. It's, it doesn't seem right, but when you zigzag in between the rows, the way I kind of numbered these, let me, let me put some numbers in here. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So here it's every third. Does that make sense? Okay. It's kind of an odd way of numbering things, but how's everybody doing so far with these sampling techniques, all right? Well, I feel like um, Vanessa Williams. Anybody know who Vanessa Williams is? Just when you thought your chance had passed, 
you go and save the best for last. There's a song called best, Save the Best for Last. It's a good song. These last two are very, very confusing. Actually, there's three, there's three more. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the, the most difficult one to talk about uh, before we get to the best two. So multi-stage. Multi-stage is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a combination. A combination of all um, other sampling methods. used for extremely large populations, such as everyone in the United States. And I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, because we still have to talk about the other two methods. And the other two methods are kind of confusing. But multi-stage is a combination of simple random and convenience, let's say. Or maybe systematic and self-selected. We pick every third person. We send them out a survey. And then if they answer the survey, well, then, then they're part of our sample. Okay, Does that make sense a little bit about a multi-stage? So we've got this one, and I'm just going to start with the visual. I'm going to start with the visual. And I'm actually going to do a side-by-side -side of these two. We'll lock this in place. We'll go lock this in place. So what I want to do is I want to split this into two different groups. So I want to say, okay, here we go. I'm about to split this. Here's my dividing line. I'm going to say, I want to split this. Here's my dividing line. So, so far, they look the same, don't they? You know what? I want to split this up into smaller groups. I want to split this up into smaller groups. So I'm going to split it up here, and I'm going to split it up here. And I'm going to split it up here, and I'm going to split it up here. So far, they look the same. We subdivide them, okay? Smaller groups. Let me go ahead and clone that. Drag that right over here, smaller groups. In one of them, they're called one thing, and the other call, they're called the other thing. Now we're going to randomly choose a few of the groups. Randomly choose a few of the groups. The other one is way different. I'm tripping over my mic cord here. That's okay. I'm going to clone this, but it's not going to be the exact same thing. I'm going to randomly choose a few whoa from each bless you a few from each of the groups what so in the one I'm going to randomly choose a, a few of the groups in the other I'm going to randomly choose a few from each of the groups so when I randomly choose a few of the groups, I'm going to pick this one randomly. And maybe that one randomly. But when I do that, I am going to use I am going to use the entire subgroup, the entire subgroup, okay? I am using everybody or everything in that entire subgroup. Those subgroups there are called clusters. So guess what the name of that one is? It's called sampling by clustering. Okay. So this technique is called clustering. 
you better believe that an upcoming essay question is going to be explain the difference between clustering and this other one. And in clustering, you do subdivide the population into smaller subgroups, and those subgroups are called clusters. And then you randomly choose a few of the clusters, but you'll select everything within each of those clusters, or every one within each of those clusters. Okay? So that's called clustering. It reminds me of peanut brittle for some reason. I don't know why. You ever break off a piece of pre peanut brittle? You ever get a piece of peanut brittle that's got no peanuts in it? That's my favorite part, because I don't like peanuts. Anybody ever go to the, the Chinese restaurant in Streetsboro? They have this one peanut butter uh, dessert. Oh my gosh, there's so many peanuts in it. So many peanuts in it. My phone's ringing. Okay, so if you're watching this back, you didn't even miss anything. But um, So peanut brittle. We we're talking about peanut brittle. And there's a, there's a restaurant in Streetsboro. They have this peanut butter dessert, and it's got about 8,000 peanuts in every single bite. Um, anyway, this other technique, the smaller groups are called strata. The smaller groups are called strata, or maybe it's stratum. The pluralization with the English language sometimes confuses me. I'm not sure if each one is a stratum or a strata, so you might want to check with your English teacher on that to, to get the, the final say, the final word. But um, each one of the subgroups is called a, a stratum. And what you'll do is you'll randomly choose a few from each of the subgroups. So you might randomly choose this one here. And this one here. And technically, this is really proportionate, too. Um, in other words, what's going to happen or what's not going to happen is if there's a smaller subgroup, you're not going to pick 15 from that. And then if there's a larger subgroup, you're not going to pick less uh, out of that. So if I look at this group right next to it, um, I'm probably going to pick randomly. And, and who knows how the random is going to happen. But I'm randomly going to pick maybe three from that one. okay? And then the other one, randomly pick two from that one, and then the other one randomly pick two from that one, and then the other one randomly pick three from that one, okay, and then the other one randomly pick two from that one, okay? So what do you reckon this technique is called? When we break it down into clusters, it's called clustering. When we break it down into strata, it's called, it's hard to pronounce, but it makes sense. It's called stratified. 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 This is a stratified sampling technique. Okay? Not stratified. Not satisfied. It's stratified. Just one is. So again, with the pros. And the cons. I'm going to use a big word, a big H word. Anybody know the stigma that, that towns get? Anybody know what the per worst part of Los Angeles is? South Central. Anybody know what the worst part of Atlanta is? South Central. Anybody know what the worst part of Warren is? South Central. Anybody know what the worst part of Ravenna is? South Central. It's just the way it is. For whatever reason, cities... Traditionally, the south central area of the city is the worst. So do you see a problem with, with clustering? Warren's got all kind of people that live in it. And the south central is where all the, the gangsters and thugs and prostitutes and drug addicts live. Why? Because that's where low-income housing was in Warren. Not to say there's, there's not a few that live somewhere else, but that's where most of them live in Warren. Um, the upper west side 
of Warren is Champion. Anybody familiar with Champion? There's some really nice houses in Champion. Most of the people that live there, um, their average family household income is about 150,000 a year. Do you think that that sample, Champion and and the ghetto, do you think that's representative of all of Warren? No. So a definite con is because of homogeneousness, homogeneosity. Because of homogeneosity, because of homogeneosity. I don't know if that's a word. Might want to look that up. Homogeneosity. Because people typically live, if we're talking about people, and we're, we're serving people, or even grass, let's face it, there's going to be areas of grass on the front lawn where there's a big brown patch because somebody's dog went out there and peed, or maybe somebody had to go after the football game and they went behind their car or something, I don't know. Or maybe a, a neighboring school came and put lighter fluid on there and, and drew something inappropriate on the front lawn and set it ablaze. Okay? But there's going to be homogeneous, similar patches of grass that have similar attributes, right? Let's think about with, a, with an automobile being made. What happens if everybody on the first shift was up late last night watching the Browns game or the Steelers game or whatever football game? Chances are that those automobiles are going to have some stuff wrong with them because those people are tired because they were up watching their team and they're mad and they're making mistakes, right? It's that kind of Because of homogeneity, it's a bad thing with clustering. Uh, so it's not representative, not representative of the population. Not likely to be, not likely to be, okay? It's not likely to be representative of the entire population. Um, if you look at stratified, if it's done properly, it looks, looks proportional. It looks pretty good, doesn't it? So I would say a pro to this is it's not likely to produce bias. Can we think of a, a, a good thing about clustering? Going back to the homogeneous nature, maybe we do want info, info about a particular group. You know, what if we're finding out about crime in Warren? We probably really do want to know about people that live in the Upper West Side whose houses are getting broken into and people in the South Central and how they both feel so we can compare and contrast. So if that's the nature of our survey, then maybe that's what we do want to know. So it's not necessarily a horrible thing, this homogeneous nature of things. So if you know anybody that lives on the, in the South Central area of Warren, I do too. My friend actually lives, lives there, so I'm not saying my friend is a thug or a, 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 a drug dealer or a whatever, but... He's not. My friend's a good guy. He's a, he actually like polices the neighborhood. So, does he have a gun? I'm not going to comment on that. Um, are there any questions about the lesson today? Concerns? Short debates? Long debates? What are the cons for stratified? I really can't think of one. As long as it's followed to plan, it's pretty good. As long as it's followed to plan, I think it's pretty good. If you think of one, let me know. So that's it. It's been real. It's been fun. I'll see you next time. Good.